My name is Paula van Hennig. I work at the Dutch regulatory agency, so the Medicines Evaluation Board. And I'm one of the two uh, Dutch representatives in the European Committee that deals with marketing authorization uh, in the EU. Um, today, I will talk about minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma and the European regulators' view on this. Next slide, please. My presentation has actually two topics. The first one is about MRD itself. How is it measured? How it can be used? And what is what we do not know about MRD? And the second topic is uh, the EMAS position on the use of MRD in multiple myeloma. And is MRD a valid endpoint for drug approval, which is a very important question. And I guess I would not be here if this would, this would not be a matter of uh, discussion. So that leads me to the second part of um, that I would like to discuss in in this uh, with regard to this topic, and it is what would be uh, needed in terms of other information from a regulatory point of view to uh, make MRD indeed a valid endpoint for drug approval. Next slide, please. So how to measure MRD? Uh, perhaps this has also been addressed by other uh, speakers uh, before me. So just uh, a brief recap is that, and that is that uh, currently MRD is measured by next generation flow cytometry or next generation sequencing, which are both very sensitive methods, which means that they can detect a very low level of cancer cells among normal cells, up to one in a million even. Um, and that is, of course, very helpful for, uh, for its purpose in saying that you want to measure um, as low as level of disease as possible. It is, of course, important to realize that each test method has its own limitations uh, and also its own strengths, but also indeed the limitations and that has to be considered when you're thinking about what you want to use it for. Another aspect in relation to MRD that is important to re realize and, uh, is that it's uh, repetitively measured in bone marrow and considering that it's, it is an invasive uh, procedure, it is uh, very important that um, there are indeed, uh, there's this necessity to develop uh, tests that can measure MRD in peripheral blood. Uh, and in, in case that has been done or will be done, I, and I, there's a, quite some interest to, for, for, for that in both from the clinical perspective as well, I guess, from pharmaceutical companies, is that uh, when you test for MRD in peripheral blood, this needs to be validated so that we need to be sure that what we previously measured in bone marrow represents the same type of information as when you measure MRD in peripheral blood. Next slide, please. So how can MRD be used or potentially be used? First of all, it is used to determine whether the treatment has eradicated the myeloma or whether traces remain, but that is of course already captured in, in the term itself, minimal residual disease. Also, it enables us to compare the anti-disease activity of different treatments and monitor the patient remission state. That's sort of a, a consequence of uh, being able to understand whether the drug has effectively reduced disease in a patient. It also helps um, detecting the recurrence of the myeloma and in, at some point choosing the treatment that will best meet the needs. However, what is still under debate and not uh, particularly used in clinical practice is that MR, uh, uh, at least MRD is not used to uh, make a treatment decision. So when to start next treatment. Next slide, please. An important uh, and interesting aspect of MRD is that it has predictive value in terms of progression-free survival or overall survival, and that is shown on this slide. On the left side, you see a graph with uh, information regarding progression-free survival, and on the right side, overall survival. On the x-axis, you see the time, and on the y-axis, either PFS or overall survival on the right side. And the different lines in, in this um, graph shows you the, the difference in progression-free survival or overall survival. When uh, for patients that have obtained um, uh, minimal residual disease, so are MRD negative, or uh, have still a residual disease in their bone marrow, uh, 
and are MRD positive, and then comparing uh, two types of chemotherapy. So within the chemotherapy uh, type, you should compare the red with the blue one uh, line and, and the, the green with the purple line. And what you can see is that independent of the chemotherapy, the, uh, the progression-free survival for patients that have obtained MRD negativity, so are uh, red or, uh, or, uh, or green, sorry, are uh, blue or purple, they have a better uh, survival in terms of uh, recurrence of the disease or on the right side, the overall survival in comparison to the patients that have still residual disease. And in summary, this means that if you obtain minimal residual disease, so no disease is anymore detected in, in the patients, then you have a better prognosis. And this is what we call patient level surrogacy. It has predictive, MRD has predictive value. Next slide, please. So what is what we do not know about MRD? And this is a list, you know, it's quite some things we do not know. I want to highlight a few uh, topics. The first one is the optimal timing for MRD assessment during and after treatment. I must say that over the past years, there has been increased, uh, well, uh, insight has, has, has increased in this. And what, uh, what we see in clinical trials is that the that the timing for MRD assessment is getting more and more standardized uh, among between trials and com when compared when comparing different uh, types of patient populations. Um, the other thing that we're not sure about is what the meaning is of MRD negativity in specific subgroups. For instance, high risk cytogenetics has it the same sort of value, if you if you like, uh, for this kind of patients in comparison to patients with less aggressive disease. And I already told you that uh, the use of MRD to alter therapy, so treatment decisions, is, is not, uh, not uh, without debate. So whether you should could uh, use that use MRD to determine the duration of maintenance treatment or the change of treatment or add agents, that's just not uh, known. And then I come to the, actually the topic of my presentation, that is that MRD, whether MRD is a valid endpoint for drug approval. Next slide, please. So the current position that we as European regulators have is that uh, thus far, the, it is recognized that the available studies have reported indeed a correlation between MRD and progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, so we know it has predictive value. We call it, like I said, patient-level surrogacy. However, it's currently not possible to define what order of magnitude for MRD negativity would be needed to be associated with a minimal clinically relevant effect in terms of overall survival and PFS. And in other words, this is rather formal, but in other words, it means that we're not sure, we don't know, that's how I should say it, is what um, we're not sure about um, the quantitative relationship between MRD negativity and the clinical endpoints of overall survival and PFS. And this is what we call uh, that trial level surrogacy is not known. I will elaborate on that a little bit further on the next slide, please. So patient level surrogacy, I've mentioned this several times now. It, it, it means that uh, with uh, for MRD negativity, uh, it predicts a favorable effect on progression-free survival of, or, of, or overall survival. Travel, tra trial level surrogacy means that the treatment effect on MRD reliably predicts the effect size of PFS and OS. And if you focus on the right, uh, on the graph on the right side of this uh, graph, you can see what we actually mean. What uh, so what is actually needed to conclude on this? So that across various uh, trials, we should have. Um, a positive relation between the extent of MRD negativity, which is shown on the x-axis, and the extent of uh, PFS and overall survival gain. Next slide, please. So, in the absence of properly conducted validation studies, any assumed extrapolation of an effect from MRD to overall survival and PFS should be carefully justified on a case-by-case -case basis. And there, of course, there's a little bit of a problem because, of course, what would be exactly the criteria which you use to determine what, what would 
what type of data are uh, convincing to make such a decision in considering that that we're we're not actually uh, we do not know the quantitative relationship between MRD and overall survival BFS. So that is that is a matter of debate and often uh, a an, an topic for discussion in both CHMP, so that's the committee where I work in, as well as in scientific advice. The solution to this all is that the surrogacy of MRD for overall survival and PFS uh, is investigated in a systematic way using appropriate statistical techniques, using a collaborative effort to maximize the inclusion of trials. And this is a very perhaps formal way to say that we should all work together because a vast amount of data is needed to do to to do this and it has also to be done in a systematic way so people have to agree on how to collect the, the data that would that is i think the only way or we think it's the only way to be able to compare and pool results so measure mrd at the same time point after start of treatment in comparable situations and the comparable situations would be related to type of patients, patient characteristics, naive, treatment naive or relapsed refractory with or without being eligible for transplantation and, and such things, such considerations, I should say. The other aspect that's important in, in, for this is are the statistical techniques. We have to, there have to be made reasonable and relevant, clinically relevant assumptions. Um, and that is, of course, based on the information that we already know. For instance, the, the graphs that I showed you on the relationship between MRD and PFS and overall survival, I think that gives you a hint on what type of effect you can expect. And then, of course, that is something that should be um, investigated and, 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 and validated. And like I said in the beginning of um, discussing this, this uh, last topic, um, it requires collaboration between stakeholders. I think that's the only way to guarantee that there's sufficient data for initial analysis, but also for external validation. And that is, uh, that, that is needed considering the heterogeneity in the prognosis of patients and the treatment settings. And well, this is something that, um, that well, like I said, we should all work uh, together in, in order to establish this, because that I think is the only way to pro progress on this topic. And with that, I end my presentation and, Please ask me any questions if you have so. Thank you.